Bueno, hoy tenemos una, una agenda cargada, un poco diferente al spin que le dimos ayer. Eh, vamos a hablar de muchos ejemplos para mostrar un poco ese diagrama que mostramos del journey para una empresa cognitiva, más allá de lo que dijo Instalisnado. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo lo materializamos? ¿Cómo lo visualizamos? Con un montón de ejemplos, con clientes, para que realmente empecemos a, a, a hacer una ignición de esa imaginación y creatividad y tratar de traer nuevas ideas acá a la mesa, ¿no? que podamos discutir para adelante. Y nuestros próximos invitados, eh, son invitados muy especiales, no solo porque eh, las prácticas que llevan, sino porque son mi vertical, mis jefes. Eh, expertos en inteligencia artificial, expertos en advanced analytics. Eh, tenemos a Manish, Katy y Glenn, que nos van a contar un poquito cómo traemos eh, la información de todos los datos que nosotros tenemos. Así que un gran aplauso para Glenn, Manish y Katy. Gracias. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good dinner last night, right? Perfect. So, look, the three of us over the next 30 minutes are going to show you what the cognitive enterprise is from the inside out. How many of you remember the guy that stood up here dressed in all white yesterday, Matt Candy? Yeah? Yeah, so he showed you the cognitive enterprise from the outside in, building platforms, doing all that kind of stuff. We're going to focus on it slightly differently, and we're going to look at it from the inside out. And we're going to focus on three of those seven layers. Data, remember he said 80% of the data was behind the firewall? Well, in about 60 seconds, you're actually going to liberate data that's behind a firewall, and we're going to make a cognitive enterprise together. We're going to expose it to this, these deep technical things, cognitive AI, uh, natural language processing, things like that, and then we're going to explain to you how that makes an intelligent workflow. You guys ready? Good. Okay. So, uh, you're, you're not going to believe this, but I want you to take your telephones out for a minute. Telephones out. Telephones out. Now, on the table in front of you are these pay stubs. Pay stubs. You, you might have to have very long arms. You might have to pass them out. Open up your browser. Grab a pay stub in one hand. You can put it on the table. Thais, you have to do this. Okay. okay you're, you're writing. You're busy. See, the general managers are always busy, but I want her to be engaged with this. So when she talks, you guys. Anyway, so you guys have the pay stubs in hand? Yeah? Okay, so uh, open your browser, ibm.biz forward slash pay stub. And it's going to let you take a picture of this pay stub. Glenn, why are we taking pictures of pay stubs? I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute and how clients are using this to take data that they never had access to before and leverage it in a process. So, have you guys been able to open the browser, ibm.com forward slash pay stub? Take a picture yet? Yeah? Okay. We're going to, we actually have. Um, Lord willing. And by the way, um, I need to thank the event staff because this morning on the tables, there were no pay stubs. And so the event staff scurried around and we had some printer problems last night. And guys, thank you so much for pulling this together in a very, very short amount of time. So thank you very much. Anyway, um, this is the app. I'm going to refresh it so we can see. Um, usually we have about 100 or 200 of these. Now, uh, what's funny is whenever you do a live demo instead of using PowerPoint, there's this strange feeling inside of the pit of your stomach when you're standing on stage, right? Because you never know what's going to return. Anyway, so um, what we're seeing here are all the pictures that you all have been taking, right? So, and you say, Glenn, thank you very much. We're going to pull one up here. Let's see what it looks like. You know, oftentimes when we pull them up, Um, there's pictures of people's fingers, there's uh, pic the picture, you, you took a picture of your finger? Yeah, okay, good. And, and so imagine we, you're, you're trying to read something like this using a machine learning asset and then leverage it in a process, right? So that, that's what we do. I mean, I can keep pulling some more up here. Hold on here. Guys, thanks for being a part of this. It's a, it's a lot more fun when uh, 100 or 150 of you do stuff. So yeah, see, you got that little finger over there, pretty cute, right? So what we do is um, 
We take all those images and we ingest them into this cognitive digitization asset we have called content intelligence. And literally, what content intelligence job is to do, its job is to take data that's dark, right, because if it's in a piece of paper, in a PDF or whatever, data is dark, its job is to look at that and extract the data and deliver it into a process. Now, in content intelligence, what we do is we train that and you can see that on the paste of, you have uh, words like um, earnings and statement and, and tins and dollar amounts and pay rates and things like that, right? Now, <clears throat> you say to yourself, Glenn, thank you, I, I love technical demos. Let me explain to you what Fannie Mae did with this. Everybody heard of Fannie Mae? Yeah, no? Yeah. So Fannie Mae is a big mortgage lender here in North America, and what they do is they guarantee mortgages sold in the secondary market. Their mission was to try and take the time it takes to originate a mortgage from eight weeks down to one. Their biggest issue was income verification. They couldn't verify income. So they're working with all these service providers to find it, and then we said, hey, what? why don't you just have borrowers take a picture of their pay stubs and send it to you? Eight weeks down to one week. Now, the other uh, payroll involved thing is ADP. It's a client we work with. And um, they, have, uh, they make about 70,000 new payroll customers a year. And they have a room in, in India and other places of 1,800 people that are involved. And what those 1,800 people do is they take 50 or 75 page documents like this, not pay stubs, but benefits documents and reports, and they hand key them to make a new payroll customer. They ask a client 503 questions after they've keyed the data in to make sure that it's right. So what we did is we dropped cognitive digitization in we called on Matt Candy's group to reimagine the whole process. Those 503 questions are now down to 10. Their eight to 12 week process is down to two. Their cost out of that process is down 65%. And the, the net promoter score, the how happy the client is, is up 20 points. All by using cognitive digitization. Now, we don't care if it's paper, we don't care if it's video. We don't even care if it's sound. Because in manufacturing, what we're finding is the best way to detect whether a weld is good or not is not by looking at it, but by listening to the sound made while it's welded. Isn't that crazy? For Boeing, we're flying over the Boeing uh, uh, 787 with a drone and inspecting the carbon fiber molecules in the fuselage and then reporting where there's imperfections. That is a cognitive enterprise from the inside out. We're, we haven't made a platform yet. Now ADP is gonna actually release this into a platform to take advantage of it across their entire client base. But this, this concept of taking data that was in a process, liberating it so that it can be used by AI, making decisions and returning it back to the process, that's an intelligent workflow, and that's part of the cognitive enterprise from the inside out. Now, we're going to give you two more examples of the cognitive enterprise from the inside out. But everybody okay with this example? Yeah? Okay, good. Guys, thank you for being uh, great sports and working with us on the pay stub. Manish, why don't you come up and talk about a digital virtual agent and how that's part of the cognitive enterprise. Thanks. Thanks, Manish. All right, perfect. Um, my name is Manish Goyal. I lead the AI practice in our services business. And uh, every couple of years, we do a global survey of CXOs around AI adoption. 
and you know, the key value drivers that they are seeing, use cases that they are seeing. And you know, the last two times we've done it, we did it uh, last year as well, the top three value drivers that always come out is around customer experience. And actually, the first three in the, in the, the order was customer satisfaction was number one, customer retention was number two, and uh, cost, reducing the cost of customer acquisition was number three. And it makes sense, right? Almost all enterprises have a ton of data about their customers. Uh, they have, obviously, a lot of information about products and services that they are selling. Uh, but the bringing it all together and delivering what Matt you know, so nicely talked about yesterday in terms of you know, really human-centered customer experience is really, really hard. And you know, how do you take all that information that you have about your customers, how do you take uh, you know, all the call recordings that normally you've had in your call centers for audit reasons or training purposes to actually liberate that to understand what those conversations between the customer service representatives and the customers are about, right? What's the tone that they're using? What are they calling about, et cetera? And so we've taken um, you know, all of this together uh, and you know, we, what we talk about, uh, AI-enabled holistic care. And you know, the main shift that has happened uh, that you know, enterprises are still catching up on is the ability to meet customers in the channel of their choice. Now, in our day-to-day -day lives, we like to talk to each other on WhatsApp or iMessage or whatever, right? Why is it that we don't want our customers to engage with us in that same channel? That is where they live. That's where they would like to engage and communicate uh, with the brands that uh, you know, they're getting services and products from. So it's really meeting them, you know, whether it is you know, through messaging, you know, people are still going to call your call centers, right? But delivering a completely different experience, right, in a much more natural language, right, whether it is, uh, you know, through chat or when they call in, right, through what we would want to call a voice concierge, right? I think everybody hates the IVR, right, and everybody's trying to hit zero or whatever the star thing to get out of it to be able to talk to, uh, you know, an agent, right? But what if you called in? And you just said what you wanted to do, and it directed you automatically, right? You had a conversation with the IVR rather than trying to listen and then punch in numbers, right? But once you actually did that, right, I mean, you know, you could start in a chat, you could start with the voice saying, but you, let's say you have to talk to an agent, right? You have a complex issue, it can't be resolved, right? And you want to talk to a human. Usually, I find almost 95%, maybe higher, Right? When that transition happens, even after I've punched in a whole bunch of information or provided a bunch of information, it starts from zero. Right? Tell me your XYZ number, tell me this. I've already punched and spent five minutes doing that, still stuck there. Right? So how do you enable the agents to pick up exactly where the conversation you know, was left off and go from there? How do you enable them to actually use the information in real time of the conversation that they're having with the customer right, to provide real-time next best action, right, whether it is in terms of troubleshooting or recommending a new product or service based on the conversation you're having, right, all in real time. How do you enable the agents to be able to find the information in your, uh, your knowledge bases much, much faster, right? So all of this is possible uh, and enabled and driven by AI. So, you know, this is a beautiful, nice chart. Right? And it, theoretically, it sounds really good. What I want to do now is actually show you an example of uh, Hang Seng Bank. Hang Seng Bank is a bank in Hong Kong that we've been working with for uh, the last three years. And the challenge that they had, you know, they realized that they were really losing a, a large constituency of their customer base, the millennials, because of how they were set up for their customer service. And it was much broader than just customer service, right? How their website was designed in terms of communicating product services, how they got help, et cetera. And they just, you know, their research said, you know, these millennials just want to be in a messaging channel, right? So let me show you exactly what uh, Hang Seng's uh, website uh, and, and um, virtual agents that they de developed looks like. So just bear with me as I switch over here.
So Hang Seng, no, it's not good. Um, so what they did was, uh, you know, they went out and uh, built two different virtual agents. Harrow is for their retail banking customers, and uh, Berry is for their uh, commercial banking customers. And if you look at, let me just reload this page. So typically, when you uh, go to a, you know, to a main web page of, a custom, uh, of you know, any large enterprise or a bank, right, you are not normally going to see uh, you know, a virtual agent you know, front and center. Hangson's taken a very different approach, right? And you can see that on the, on the right here, right? On their main web page, you know, how can I help you, right? And, you know, there are lots of things I can do with it, right? And I can, you know, key off into one of this. Uh, today, I'm going to sort of show you really quick, you know, something new that they just rolled out around foreign exchange, right? So let's go, I'm going to confirm that. All right, so this is live. You know, we're chatting with Harrow, and you know, there's turmoil. I want to see if you know I should be uh, carrying some other currency instead of just Hong Kong dollars, right? So, what currencies can I trade? Let's, yeah, I got a list of this. Okay, you know, what is the rate for? Um, Right. So again, I'm trying to. You know, this is now. You know, I'm in the discovery mode. Right. I got some questions. I want to find out. Uh, you know, what. Uh, you know, what the rates. Uh, things are like that. Okay. That sounds interesting. You know. Let's. Uh, you know. I got a quick calculator here. Right. That's showing me what this is. Well. You know. Really. Maybe I want to in invest. Yeah. Fifty thousand. Okay. I. You know. I get a quick sense of what that might be. Again, all of this is being done in a pretty engaging uh, way. Right. Rather than. I mean, of course, you know, I could log in, you know, go to the different website, but this is pretty engaging. So, yeah, I want to look at what the what the trend rate has the trend has been, you know, over the the last few months between the Japanese yen and Hong Kong dollar. Okay, I get that, right? A lot of information right there available to me. Okay, so this looks good. I think I'm going to make a decision to actually buy some Hong, uh, you know, Japanese yen. So. Um, so let's buy, oops. All right, so I said, you know, just buy 50,000 uh, yen. Okay, I need to log in. So as you can see, right, I've been doing this discovery, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, around the product of, you know, buying foreign exchange, uh, you know, uh, unauthenticated. I can quickly at this point, Log in, and because I'm not a Hang Seng Bank user, this is running off a demo server. It's going to put me. Now, I logged in. It's going to keep all of my conversation that I was having right, right there. And it is going to ask me to confirm that you do you want to make a trade? All right. So I'm now authenticated. It's saying this is what you asked you want to do. Do you confirm that? Right? I could modify it. I say confirm. And that's done. A very different experience in being able to, and again, right, you can see on the left hand side, I could be doing this for a mortgage, a personal loan, whatever, right? This is this kind of experience that I have uh, you know, in dealing with the products and services. Now, Hang Seng Bank has one, I mean, they've been doing this now for three years. Right, they've been on this journey. They continue to expand the portfolio of you know, products and services that they offer this way. They've won a design or innovation award each of the last three years uh, in Hong Kong. A pretty, a pretty impressive you know, what they've done and a pretty rich uh, way of doing this. So let me uh, quickly wrap up here uh, by saying that this is not just about um, you know, customer-facing, right? You can, you can think about this ex delivering this kind of an experience to employees as well, right? You know, how many people love their HR experience, right? When they kind of transfer people or things of that sort in work, et cetera, right? You can give them a very similar experience, you know, for all kinds of employee services, right? Whether it be in HR, whether it be in IT, you know, procurement, 
what have we, right? And you know, we have done a lot of this within IBM itself, right? Um, we uh, rolled out a set of HR uh, virtual agents two years back, right? And we were handling about 1% of all contacts with that virtual agent in 2016. Last year, over 40% of all IBM contacts, and we have you know, 350,000 people, right? 40% of all uh, contacts were handled by our virtual agents, right? Freeing up you know, those HR resources to be more of HR partners for, for the managers and employees, right? Similar thing in our IT, right? We have over 20,000 uh, field services engineers, product engineers, right? And we were having a lot of problems in terms of the you know, time to resolution that we were offering on you know, 14,000 products uh, you know, that IBM sells. As we roll this out, right, we have, you know, for those 20,000 um, product engineers and field service, I think we have saved 45 minutes per day per agent through what I've been describing. So it's pretty powerful and, again, right, allows you to do this for our customers and internal customers, employees, uh, and services. So thank you very much. And, you know, with that, I want to transition to a last example with Kathy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Reese. I lead our advanced analytics uh, team globally. And uh, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story around the Toronto Raptors. So sports teams, just like businesses in your industries, um, struggle with pulling together all their data. It's very manual, it's time consuming, and they're really trying to get insights out of that data. This is a story about the Toronto Raptors, who, um, to Toronto Raptors, for those of you who don't know, are the only Canadian-based uh, basketball team in the NBA. So back in 2015, they were getting ready to remodel their, build a brand new practice stadium. And as part of that, they needed to create, they wanted to reimagine their war room. Now their, their war room is where they would go and make all the decisions about their roster and who they wanted to draft and, and they really would analyze all, make all their decisions in this room. This room was a bunch of tables, chairs, and magnetic whiteboards where they would have magnets with player details on it and they would just kind of move the magnets around and they would analyze all of their data which was in Excel sheets, uh, scout rosters, just tons and tons of data that they had to kind of sift through to make one move of a magnet, right? It wasn't very collaborative, it wasn't very intuitive, it was very time consuming. So as part of this remodel, they came to IBM and they said, help us recreate this command center. Allow us to really pull together all this data and make real time decisions and have access to real time data and to collaboratively move players around and figure out what kind of impacts that would, that would have to the team and to the roster. So we, we pulled together all this for them. We applied cognition to look at the team performance. What gaps did they have in the, in the team today? If they were to move this player in based off of all the analysis of the, the team statistics, the, the league statistics, what would it do? Would it, would it give us any more gaps? So it, it analyzed all of player performance and allowed them to, to make good decisions for, for real-time draft decisions. It also looked at the you know, team camaraderie. We used Watson personality insights to understand the personalities of the team. How well are these players gonna gel together both on the court and off the court? We, we analyzed their social media, their posts. We, we also did some analysis on their prior contracts and what are the odds that they're gonna finish out this contract with our team? So really talking about the, the emotional intelligence of the players to make a really solid team. And then uh, the, the last reason and, and why I really love telling this, this story is they did think about the user experience and how they were going to action these insights. I mean, this is real-time collaboration and really thinking about exactly what the people who are making the decisions, what they need to be looking at, and very, very collaborative of sharing data. All the scout data, is, everything is populated into this system now. And I've found a, a lot of the clients that I'm working with come to me and they say, we've invested so much in, in data science, we're not seeing the return of, on investment. W what's going on? And, and I think it's because they're not thinking about the end-to-end -end and the use and the experience of these analytics. Uh, data scientists, you know, by nature, are scientists. They want to experiment. They want to be competitive about who creates the best model. 
they don't necessarily think about how am I going to get this model into production? How are people actually going to use this? How am I going to maintain this? So having the right uh, common framework put together to be able to build models in a way that are reusable, repeatable, and supportable, and that have a good user experience at the very end is very, very essential to what we're doing in the world of data science today. So back to the story. Uh, in 2016, we, we launched this for their 2016 draft. And uh, you know, fast forward to this past season, and the Raptors made it to the NBA Finals, which was, people couldn't believe it. Uh, but they were up against the Golden State Warriors. And the Golden State Warriors, for those of you who don't know, are an extremely talented, expensive team. Uh, and the odds were totally against the Raptors. Uh, the, the odds makers gave them a 12% odds of actually winning the whole thing at the start of the season. But everybody loves a good underdog story, and the Raptors ended up winning the NBA championship. And I think that if that's not a really good, you know, demonstrable example of the power of data-driven decision-making, I'm not sure what is. Thank you very much. So guys, um, remember yesterday, Matt Candy talked from the outside in to make the cognitive enterprise. We tried to give you three examples from the inside out of making the cognitive enterprise. Leveraging dark data, infusing it into the process. Using digital virtual agents to fundamentally change how you care for clients. And then taking a process that used to be note cards, stickies, people yelling at each other in the room and digitizing it and delivering information to bake better decisions. That is the cognitive enterprise from the inside out, data exposed to exponential technologies to make intelligent workflows and uh, reimagine processes. Thanks for your time this morning, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>